Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm really happy that you have managed to squeeze in your time and have allowed yourself uh, to uh, participate in this wonderful webinar. I would like to uh, congratulate each and every uh, one of my colleagues uh, for finding time because it's a very uh, important and timely webinar. And I have with me a, a very distinguished guest. And I'm very happy to tell a batchmate of mine as well. And he's an oral, an oral and maxillofacial surgeon uh, from Sri Lanka. And he'll be talking to you uh, regarding the frequently asked questions regarding third molar extractions. So mind you, he has picked up this topic, uh, particularly in view uh, of various complications that he has seen uh, being uh, done by uh, practitioners all over the country and in certain parts of the world as well. And I just uh, run through uh, his uh, CV for your information. Mind you, it's a, a very long CV, so I'll just take uh, a little bits of things so that uh, we can start the webinar on time. Uh, uh, Dr. Nadia Jayasurya uh, uh, passed out uh, with BDS from University of Peradeniya in 2003, and he gained his uh, Master in Surgery oral surgery uh, from the Postgraduate Institute of Medicine in 2011. He has had extensive uh, foreign training experience in the uh, United Kingdom as well as in Australia. And uh, I'd like to take a little bit of his career highlights which are of uh, recent nature. Uh, he has received the Presidential Award for Research and Publication in 2010. Uh, and he, is he has obtained the fellowship from the International Association of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgeons. And in fact, he is the director of dental e-learning unit uh, at the uh, Faculty of Dental Sciences, University of Peradeniya. And uh, he has published a handbook of um, minor oral surgery for undergraduates as uh, of recent as in 2020, July. And uh, uh, he has been a presenter in various scientific forums and he has been uh, involved in a lot of research as well. And he has been awarded with uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, awards as well as uh, he has been given the due recognition that was needed for research as well. So I'm really happy to introduce Dr. Nadina Jayasurya uh, for the webinar, which is being co-hosted by Sri Lanka Dental Association along with uh, Commonwealth Dental Association. So without taking too much of his time, I would like to invite Dr. Nadina Jayasurya uh, to uh, uh, give his uh, speech or rather uh, conduct the webinar. And I'd like to remind uh, the, the participants, when you have questions, uh, because all your mics are muted, so you will uh, be required to type in the questions through the chat uh, room, and I'll be forwarding the questions at the end of the uh, webinar. So there's no limit for the questions, and I'm sure uh, Dr. Nadine is happy to entertain any number of questions. So uh, as long as you feel that there are certain things that you want to clarify, just don't wait until the end of the webinar to type. Just uh, type it then and there. So I'll, I'll screen the questions and I'll forward it at the end of the uh, webinar. Over to you, Nadina. Uh, thank you very much, Siriman. Uh, thank you for your kind introduction. And I would like to thank uh, SLBA and uh, um, Ravi for uh, giving me this chance. So I'm going to share the screen now. Hope everyone can see the screen. Yeah, I think, yeah. Okay. So um, um, I decided to have this topic because uh, we learn best when we have questions. So um, dental surgeons are trainees have asked me these questions from me. So I collected a few and obviously I inclu included a few of my questions as well. So uh, that is how this slideshow is going to be. Uh, it's on uh, frequently asked questions by dental surgeons and trainees about wisdom tooth surgery. Um, and uh, by preparing this uh, lecture series, I learned a lot and I have changed my practice as well after learning, after preparing this slide. So 
we say learning is change of behavior. So I hope that you would at least take one thing from this and start practicing and change behavior. So uh, there's no uh, order in these uh, question lines. So we'll take one question at a time and discuss. Okay. So one question was, can a wisdom tooth erupt and give problems before the age of 17 years? We know that uh, wisdom tooth uh, classification and uh, this definition talks about an eruption age. So over 17 years, we see the wisdom tooth erupting. That's a, a common trend in these countries, but there are some countries where uh, eruption age can be much earlier. But in my practice, I have seen uh, about three patients who are, were 15 years uh, old. So that means now we see in some patients, the wisdom tooth starting to erupt into the mouth and they get complications. So how do we manage this? And uh, how do we go about uh, managing the patient? Because at this age, uh, are we going to remove the wisdom tooth surgically or not? That's a bit of a question because uh, we are not used to managing wisdom teeth in such a younger patient. Um, so in my experience, what I have considered was uh, whether the problem is recurrent because obviously at this stage, uh, the problem comes from the pericoronal infection the wisdom tooth is erupting into the mouth and there's pericoronal infection. So if we can uh, give antibiotics uh, and settle the infection, so like following NICE guidelines, uh, if the infection settles, then we can observe what's gonna happen in the wisdom tooth. But then um, the tricky question is, if it is recurrent, then we have to go for a opiculectomy that is trying to allow the wisdom tooth to erupt because still under the definition, it's an erupting tooth, still not impacted. And this depends on the type of the impaction. That means what's the direction this tooth is coming out. So considering such factors, the recurrent of the infection, and then the type of impaction, if it is a vertical impaction, I think there's a good chance the tooth might erupt and we can observe. But if it's a, a horizontal or mesioangle impaction, which is not favorable, and if the patient is getting recurrent infections, then we have to consider surgical removal. But in a child, um, mostly the surgical removal is going to be difficult and mostly they require uh, general anesthesia. So this is one question that uh, was asked and I too have um, seen in my practice. The next most interesting thing is, is the, the, the canal, inferior dental canal, whether it's close to the roots of the third molar. Um, we had this practice where we used to take the IOPAs, IOPAs and then see the close relationship. But uh, even though we discuss and teach this, I find a lot of referrals from dental surgeons send in to me uh, because they see the nerve overlapping the uh, roots, especially because it's an IOPA and there's an angle in taking the radiograph. So... I would say that uh, we will need to take uh, OPG to assess the, uh, the status of the nerve and let's see how we can come to a conclusion. So when we take a OPG radiograph, um, the canal can be seen better. And uh, still, it is a bit of a doubt uh, to exactly know whether the root is close to the nerve or not, because it's a two-dimensional x-ray. So when we look at the literature, uh, these two studies, they talk about 
mesioangular impactions being the closest to the ID canal. And interruption of white lines, that is, seems to be the most significant uh, indicator of a close relationship to the ID canal. So uh, one study in 2013 talks about these two factors as very important indicators. Another study in 2011, they talk about root darkening and displacement of the ID canal as one of the most important indicators that the nerve and the root may be in close association. So if we are going to take as pictures, you can see that root darkening uh, deviation of the canal and loss of the white line of the ID canal. And if this is more than three millimeters, they say that it is of very much significance. So, and also the mesioangular impaction seems to be a bit more close, closer to the ID canal than other uh, impactions of similar pell and Gregory uh, classification stage. So remember, similar Pell and Gregory classification stage. So uh, Pell and Gregory 1A, uh, mesioangular one, would be close to the ID canal than the others. So if you take a OPG and find darkening, and loss of the white line, um, these are some indicators that you have to think of. Maybe clean. Nobody is there. Ah, right. 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 So then go to the cone beam CT. Uh, so when should we take a cone beam CT? That is when you have found out that there is a close relationship uh, to the canal through examining your OPG. So earlier we talked about a root darkening, uh, deviation of the canal and loss of the white line. So in the cone beam CT, when we examine, we can see a very round canal with the cortical margin well away from the roots of the third molar. Or else you can see the canal touching the roots of the third molar. When the canal is touching the uh, roots of the third molar, you have to see whether the cortical border of the ID canal is clearly seen. If it is seen, then uh, the risk is less. But if it is not seen, that means the tooth has caused a resorption of the uh, ID canal cortical bone. So the root and the nerve can be in a close approximation than uh, when the cortical rim is there. So these three specific uh, shapes of the ID canal has been described in literature. So round uh, is much safer because it's away from the roots and the oval shape, which is coming closer to the root, there you have to observe whether the cortical outline of the ID canal is present and then you have a narrowing of the canal, which shows that it is very close to the roots of the third molar tooth. So again, uh, this diagram shows different shapes of the uh, canal. Here, oval, round, and dumbbell shape, and a teardrop shape. So uh, research has shown that buccal position or lingual position of the ID canal has a higher risk than inferiorly placed ID canal. Direct contact of the ID canal to the root of the tooth is associated with increased risk, especially when the cortical bone is missing from the canal. And then this dumbbell shape and the teardrop shape, when that is associated with the roots, uh, this is said to be having a higher risk of nerve damage when you do the surgery. So coming back to the main question, um, is there an association between uh, the inferior allular canal and the root of the third molar? So this is a very important 
decision that we need to take because it, it might risk uh, temporary or permanent nerve damage. So we need to avoid permanent nerve damage. So uh, OPG radiograph would be an initial assessment and you would assess whether uh, the nerve has some indicators suggesting it's close to the roots. And if it is, if these indicators are present, then it is just for you to take in. You can look for these relations. The next question is difficult to obtain anesthesia. What can we do? So this is a very frequent uh, encounter. I'm sure all of you had this uh, issue. Uh, the patient would come with uh, severe pain. And then when you try to surgically remove, attempt it, uh, the patient will have severe pain. Uh, that is mainly due to a tooth can be fractured to um, put your elevators, the pulp gets stimulated and the patient gets severe pain. Um, but as we know that inferior allular nerve block, which we use, doesn't work all the time. So it works only about 70 to 80%. So uh, better to repeat the injection and see whether it works. But if it doesn't, um, if there's an infection, Better to start an anti-inflammatory and um, and um, apart from this antibiotics and steroid uh, the NSAIDs, a bupivacaine that is marcaine that's not commonly used in dental clinics um, has shown to be more effective in patients with irreversible pulpitis. So in the hospital setup, you can uh, use Marcaine uh, because it's very cardiac sensitive. So you have to be careful in uh, avoiding in patients with cardiac issues as well as uh, avoid giving uh, intravascular. So Marcaine um, is a long acting anesthetic. When it's used for anesthetizing uh, with the inferior allular nerve block, uh, it has shown to be better for patients with irreversible pulpitis. So that is also one, uh, one thing that we can do uh, in these troublesome patients. So whatever you do sometimes, again, when you attempt, uh, there is pain when you try to move the tooth. Uh, the anesthesia has worked because you know the lip has got numb and the buccal gingiva and the lingual gingiva is numb. So everything is suggesting that your anesthesia has worked. But still, when you try to move the tooth, the patient gets pain. So intraligamentary anesthesia has worked. And I, in my practice, I have uh, attempted this and seen how comfortable the patient becomes after intraligamentary anesthesia works. So. One thing you have to remember is that patients don't usually lie. So when you give anesthesia, but you try to move the tooth, the patient says it's painful. So uh, I would uh, tell you, uh, please uh, trust the patient and then try to give an intraligamentary anesthesia. So how to give a proper intraligamentary anesthesia? So this is a, uh, something that we need to uh, be skilled at. We have to use a very thin needle, not the usual 27 or larger needles. Uh, use a thin one as possible. I would advise you to use the insulin syringe that's available in Sri Lanka. And uh, not the one with the removable hub, but with the fixed hub. Because the removable hub uh, will try to disengage when you try to apply pressure. So use a thin needle and then insert it between the tooth and the bone uh, in a mesiobuccal area uh, going deep into the tooth at around a 30 degree angle. So remember the most important thing here is 
the bevel of the needle should be facing the bone, not the tooth side. Because what we want is the anesthesia to come out of the bevel and that would be easier towards the bone side. So uh, lignocaine and adrenaline both uh, should be used here. Uh, and that's more effective. That's the usual dental anesthesia. And the next thing is you should hold the back pressure for at least 10 seconds. So uh, with experience, you know that anesthesia doesn't get released uh, if you have really engaged the needle properly and just keep the back pressure for 10 seconds or more and then anesthesia will slowly release in. Usually the patient might get pain during this uh, time, so you might um, inform the patient beforehand. Sometimes intraligamentary injection might not work the first time. So once you start moving the tooth, the patient might say he or she has pain and then you stop and then you start inserting the needle. So like that, as you loosen the tooth, you might see uh, the needle is going deeper and it will become effective. Uh, the usual success rate uh, in the mandible area is considered around 55%, but still gradually, if you continue to use it, um, you will find at the last bit of taking the tooth out, the patient will be comfortable. The next thing is uh, patient having pain because of the exposed pulp. Here, we need to insert a needle in, again, the tiny needle, and then release anesthesia. But again, this is a very painful procedure for the patient. So if the opening is bigger, I would advise you to put some benzocaine, 15% benzocaine is available as marcaine, uh, mucopane. So mucopane, is a, is a trade name uh, and uh, benzocaine is available uh, in 15%. So that's the available one in Sri Lanka. You can uh, put a little bit of benzocaine into the pulp chamber, wait for about 20 seconds and then uh, insert the needle and give the injection under pressure. So uh, intrapulpal anesthesia will work, um, but for a short time, unless you anesthetize the whole pulp, uh, and you can start either section in the tooth after that or else engaging your elevators and taking the tooth out. Um, I have used uh, the, the normal lignocaine jelly and the silocaine spray, but uh, it has not been very effective, but 15% uh, benzocaine is much more effective than those. The next one is trismus. Trismus is a very annoying um, side effect uh, after third molar surgery. Um, sometimes patients have gone up to about two months uh, without being able to open the mouth. And it is really distressing to the patient because they feel uh, they will never be able to open the mouth again. So we need to reassure the patients. But the most of all, the question is, can we avoid trismus? Um, so when we raise the mucoperiosteal flap, when we go beyond the external oblique ridge and when we explore the lingual, the medial side of the, the, the third mole area, uh, the chances of trismus is more. Uh, next is repeated injections through the muscles going through the medial pterygoid. Uh, can cause spasms and subsequent um, trismus. And again, uh, prolonged mouth opening that we can support with a rubber prop, asking the patient to bite rather than keeping the mouth open. That would avoid uh, developing trismus. And remember, avoid needle tract infections. Once you have given a block injection, and then if you use the same needle to give something like a intraligamentary anesthesia, uh, do not use that needle again uh, to give a block. So if you need to repeat your uh, inferior allular nerve block injection, best is to take a new needle and use as anesthesia. So uh, the next most important thing is 
uh, advising the patient on mouth opening exercises. So in my practice, I find uh, this trismus, post-operative trismus as uh, not a very common complication because I really emphasize on opening the mouth from the next day. So I advise the patients to put three fingers and try to open the mouth first day after surgery and continue that at, as two to three times a day for about two weeks time. So um, they would, uh, you know, text or call back and say, still I can't open three fingers, but um, about two, two and a half. So gradually they will uh, develop normal mouth opening. But this exercise after surgery is very important. And obviously pre-medication with steroids, uh, NSAIDs, and a medicine called serapeptidase. Again, I will discuss about that in a future slide. Um, these are very important pre-medication that will help reduce trismus. Uh, I came across a new technique. Uh, actually, this was published long time back, but uh, I found this when I was uh, looking for these slides. Um, this is an anterior, you know, anterior technique to the traditional inferior alveolar nerve block injection. Um, the person who described uh, is suggesting to give the anesthesia at an anterior location and going across the first molar of the opposite arch. So this avoids going through the um, medial pterygoid muscles. And as in this picture, you will see releasing 2.5 or more uh, ml into this anterior location, not only anesthetizes the inferior alveolar nerve, but also the lingual and the buccal, buccal nerves. So I have tried this and it works, but you need to, uh, there, there is a bit of a learning curve. So, um, starting from the opposite side molar, going to a slightly anterior position than the usual uh, immediate lateral area from the pterygomandibular alpha, you go in and release a full 2.5 ml anesthesia. So it will diffuse um, to the depth as well as it could diffuse laterally. And in one injection, you can anesthetize all three nerves. So, uh, this technique, uh, the author has done a um, randomized control trial, a split mouth study, and uh, shown that uh, patients who receive this anterior technique has less trismus um, compared to the people who get the traditional ID block. So then, what is the best flap? technique for third molar surgery. You know that uh, why we raise a flap is to get good access to the surgical site. It should be uh, providing adequate access. Uh, the flap should maintain its vascularity and not become necrosed. And uh, there should be less damage to adjacent structures and the flap lines should not fall on the bony defects and it should be easy to approximate after surgery. Um, so these are the basic uh, uh, important factors of selecting a flap. So most of the flaps meet these criteria. So two common flaps used are envelope flap, uh, which is shown in this diagram. It doesn't have a vertical release, but it goes along the clavicle uh, space of the six and seven and goes on the external oblique ridge. So it's easy to approximate after the surgery is done and um, it gives a good visibility to the surgical site. But this triangular flap uh, starting at the distal area of the seven, this is my favorite flap. Um, this is the one which I've done for my uh, MD exam as well. And I have continued to practice this. Um, this has uh, an advantage where, again, it gives good visibility. Uh, and um, because of the vertical release, the excess blood 
tends to come out from here. We don't suture this vertical, uh, the cut. So uh, that uh, avoids hematoma formation. And also because it doesn't go into the, uh, the gingival area, the periodontal areas of seven and six, there is less uh, periodontal damage and dehiscence of the flap compared to the triangular flap. So there are studies to show that this triangle flap has much more superior features compared to the, the conventional envelope flap. But uh, the disadvantage is because you put a vertical cut and dissect it more, and the patient tends to get a, a bit more swelling than the triangle, uh, the envelope flap. So selecting the flap that you uh, want for the surgery is your choice, but um, think about how you can benefit and the patient can benefit from uh, the procedure that you do. Sorry. So does, uh, does pre-medication help? So we talk about um, pre-medication. There are studies showing that if you give uh, painkillers, uh, NSAID steroids, before surgery, you can uh, reduce the post-operative pain, swelling, and trismus. So yes, it does help. So it does help, and it has uh, been proven, and uh, there are a lot of studies to support these. But Different, different types of medicines have been used and uh, it's a bit complicated. So that's why I think most people don't actually practice this, but uh, pre-medicating the patient with analgesics um, and steroids. And again, this serapeptidase, which uh, again, I'll talk about it later, um, has shown to reduce the post-operative pain and the post-operative swelling and trismus. So if patients don't wish to take an IV dose of steroids, uh, that's perfectly fine. You can give uh, oral steroids about one hour before the procedure. And uh, in this diagram, it shows um, a state of hypersensitivity, um, which develops when we do the surgery, can be reduced when we give uh, preoperative anti-inflammatory analgesia uh, as well as uh, steroids. So depending on what can be used on which patient, uh, you can decide how you can, uh, uh, you can uh, use these medications as pre-medication. So, uh, yes, uh, the patients who come with severe third molar pain uh, associated with the third molar, uh, even after surgery, they continue to have severe pain. Um, this I have seen, um, especially uh, when the pain is so uh, refractory uh, to antibiotics and analgesia. Uh, we put the patient under a sedation or general anesthesia and extract the wisdom uh, tooth. But uh, surprisingly, or not so surprisingly, we see the pain continuing after the procedure as well. So they continue to have severe pain. So this study has shown uh, uh, use of uh, morphine, one milligram of morphine mixed with the uh, uh, local anesthesia, that is lignocaine with adrenaline, uh, given as an inferior nerve block, uh, to reduce post-operative chronic pain uh, and it starts action after about 12 hours. So again, this is something that I have um, started to practice after you know, making this uh, set of slides. So thank you again. Um, uh, so they say that teaching is the best way to learn. So now I have done this uh, on few patients and they all have better pain recovery after um, the wisdom tooth surgery. Um, so anxious patients. So that's another tricky question. So patients are scared. 
and uh, it's not good to put them under general anesthesia because uh, that is uh, uh, that, that has to uh, have a different set of um, you know environment and uh, the patient's health conditions and all those things play a role and um, it may be unnecessary uh, for patients who can uh, deal with medication so we call this conscious sedation so we don't need to go into propofol and nitrous oxide setup but in your clinic, uh, you may be able to relieve patient anxiety by just giving uh, oral uh, anti and, and anxiolytics. So if the patient is not so scared, but a bit worried, uh, you can start with five milligrams uh, of diazepam one, uh, one hour before. So uh, the sedation effect is a bit less in this and it uh, helps to calm the patient down and, um, and it has a long lasting effect on um, anxiety. But for patients who are really, really anxious and really scared, uh, midazolam uh, seems to be a better choice, but um, here the patient would really become, uh, you know, it's very obvious you can see the patient is getting a bit drowsy uh, but it reduces anxiety and helps you in your surgery. So for use of midazolam, um, it's best that you uh, have, uh, you know, set up where you can take care of the patient. And uh, both of these medications, you have to warn the patient not to come driving and uh, to drive back uh, when they're going off surgery. So uh, midazolam as well can be very uh, safely used in most patients and even in combination with other medications that we use. So uh, you'd be surprised how some uh, really scared patients uh, uh, really bravely face the surgery after they are given a dose of uh, anxiolytics. Um, this may be a bit of a silly question, but uh, there, there are no silly questions, but only silly intentions. So uh, let's look at this. Should I use a round or a fish paper? Uh, it, it, it is, uh, it is a surgeon's choice to start, um, whether it's a round or the fish paper to start. Uh, trimming the bone around the wisdom tooth um, will help to expose the root part where you need to section as well as give you an area for buccal elevation. But when it comes to splitting the tooth, yes, definitely we need to go for a fissure burr. Uh, but the most important question or the most important thing to highlight here is, it's not whether you are using a round burr or a fissure burr at the beginning or else uh, a fissure burr to cut the roots. But the most important thing is the size of the burr. If you use a bigger uh, burr, there's going to be a large area of bone loss around the tooth and it will not make it easy for you to engage uh, the elevator. So having a gutter kind of a bone removal is the best uh, in the buccal area and the mesiobuccal area because you need to engage your elevator so lift the tooth out. And also when you're going to split either the crown or the roots, make sure that you use a very thin burr, uh, thin fissure burr, otherwise your couplen, once you put it in and turn, it will be too small to make a fracture in the line that you have made. So making a fine cut um, with a fissure burr helps to split the roots easily. So. Uh, rather than the shape of the, uh, the burr at the beginning and, um, and when splitting with a fissure burr, remember to use a small burr, uh, which will help you to uh, nicely elevate and split the teeth wherever it's uh, necessary. So do I need to split a mesioangular wisdom tooth, which has no obstruction? So, um, in my practice, I have seen uh, many dental surgeons just lifting the uh, mesioangular tooth, especially when it has uh, decay in the mesial aspect of the crown. So there's no obstruction to the 
seven and easily the tooth will try to lift up. So it's a very common thing most people do. Uh, and uh, I don't know whether uh, they have actually, they would actually follow up the patient to see whether there's nerve damage. Um, but why we don't do this is obviously due to the arc of rotation, it can damage uh, the inferior allular nerve, which is close by to the tooth. So in this study, uh, influence of tooth sectioning. So they have shown there's a 14% higher incidence of nerve injury um, uh, when the tooth is not sectioned and just elevated. And this is more mostly seen in Pell and Gregory uh, 1B and 1C when the tooth is at a uh, more deeper level and when you need to trim the bone distal to the, uh, the wisdom tooth. So remember, if you are somebody who is going to lift the um, mesioangular tooth without splitting it, at least think that whether it is at a more superficial level and uh, in the OPG, see the nerve relationship to the root and assess whether there is good space for the tooth to rotate and if you need to remove bone distal to the tooth to uh, uh, elevate the tooth, uh, these things must be suggesting that you're running uh, a risk of damage in the inferior little nerve. So be careful when you do this. So what treatment options are available when uh, the nerve is close by? So inferior allular nerve is um, close to the third molar root, what can we do? So you know that coronectomy is a well-established procedure and uh, where we remove uh, part of the tooth, including the whole crown and uh, the root part. Uh, here, if you don't know, the main principle is leaving about three millimeters of bone around the tooth so that uh, there is good bone formation about the roots. And the next thing is, if you make sudden movements where you split the tooth, uh, the root can start to migrate later. Apart from this, uh, there are two other techniques called serial sectioning and orthodontic assisted tooth movement. So <clears throat> serial sectioning means if there is a root close to the uh, canal, you just cut the top part of the tooth and just leave it. And if it's going to expose the pulp chambers and the, uh, the vital parts, you have to remove those and just let it be. And then the tooth will start migrating. Uh, so this is just like a, a poorly performed uh, a coronectomy where the roots have moved, uh, they will gradually start distancing from the uh, root canal, uh, the inferior allular canal. Uh, this technique shows uh, orthodontic assisted tooth movement. So you can uh, put uh, bracket uh, wires and sometimes from the opposite uh, arch elastics to extrude the tooth so that it, it will be easily removed from a surgical means. So the tooth will start uh, migrating away from the inferior allular canal so that you can start the treatment. So. Uh, know that there are different techniques. Um, you might not use these, but definitely knowing them is beneficial. So uh, when we do a coronectomy, it doesn't uh, succeed all the time because we expect the, the cut part of the root to remain in situ, but it doesn't and it will migrate. So there's a failure rate from 2% to 38%. And uh, uh, the migration usually uh, happens the most within the first year. And there can be over two to three millimeters of tooth migration. So um, it is recommended if you leave a root, uh, take a X-ray after one year and you can assess where the uh, tooth has gone to. So um, sometimes we we plan to take the tooth out. We are not planning a coronectomy. We just go to take the tooth out, but for certain reasons, 
it doesn't come out. The last part of the tooth doesn't come out. So there are situations that we leave uh, the third molar root inside and then close the flap and come out. So is this bad? Um, obviously, as long as we don't harm the patient by trying to dig in and causing inferior allular nerve damage, definitely this is better. But there are no studies uh, assessing re retained roots of third molars. Uh, but there's this study which talks about what happens to roots that are left, which is a common thing in our dental practice. So as long as the, the pulp is not infected and the, the root part is minimally mobilized uh, and there's a complete wound closure, there won't be any issues and the root part will remain. But if you have moved the uh, root, there's nothing to worry. It will act as a foreign body and gradually start uh, migrating to the surface where you can remove it later very easily. Just inform the patient what are the uh, most probable C quality. But if the tooth has an infected pulp, um, we should remove the pulp area. At least with the burr, you can drill in the pulp chambers and remove the necrotic areas. And, uh, but still, with antibiotic cover, you can leave the root in and follow up the patient to see whether uh, uh, the infection settles. So, Coronectomy procedures, now uh, as you're talking about it, it leaves part of the, uh, the pulp chamber uh, inside the roots. So can this give pain? So this is another question. Uh, usually it doesn't, uh, but some people advocate trying to do root canal treatment to the retaining roots uh, or else trying to uh, remove the pulp and closing the top part of the tooth with MPA. Um, this uh, study has shown that trying to do root canal treatment has no additional benefit from just leaving the vital pulp inside the tooth. But uh, like I told earlier, if there is an infection and the pulp chamber is necrotic, uh, it would benefit from trying to remove whatever the pulp necrotic material from inside the roots and then closing with the flap. <clears throat> My sutures keep coming out and the flap opens. So the patient comes back and uh, when you look into the mouth, you see uh, the sutures have got removed and uh, the socket has now opened. So food collects in and uh, patient complains about um, food going in and worried what's going to happen. So even if that happens, there's nothing to worry. Um, it will gradually fill up from the bottom and the, the cavity will become shallower and patient will stop having issues with it. But why does it uh, not stay together? So this is uh, a diagram from one of the papers we publish and we realized that uh, when in such a situation where the, the tooth is in a pill and Gregory B or um, C, where the depth is uh, much deeper, um, the lingual side has an epithelium cover over the uh, crown of the tooth. So mostly uh, what we do is that we raise the buccal flap and then we try to suture it to the lingual flap. But when you look closely in such situations, you will have an epithelialized margin on the lingual side. So if you suture the raw buccal area to the epithelialized lingual margin, that is not going to heal. So once the sutures come out, it is going to open up. So remember, inspect that area. And if it is having an epithelium, you can nicely see that you will need to scrape it out or cut it off and then suture the two margins together. So this is one important uh, area that you need to concentrate. Otherwise, your flap will open up after the sutures are removed. The next two most important things are, when you use vicryl sutures, you need to have at least three knots to stabilize the uh, vicryl knot. Otherwise, it will try to 
release open up and also at least three to four millimeters or more uh, thread should be left at the knot level. So when your assistant is cutting the knot, make sure that it is not cut too close to the, uh, the knot so it will open up with time. So these threads can come out. So considering these three factors, you can make sure that your flap stays together until the wound is completely healed. This will uh, reduce a lot of uh, complications. So can we uh, do a procedure under local or general anesthesia? So this is a uh, uh, question that uh, some uh, even patients uh, ask. So um, having general anesthesia either can be uh, a difficult uh, surgical procedure where we need to uh, take longer time, uh, have good vision, uh, and we need to section the tooth and we need to you know, be careful where the roots are close to the inferior alveolar nerve. Or else the other factors are patient anxiety and uh, patient's age. As we get older, the, the bone becomes more brittle and studies have shown patient's weight has also a significant contribution to the difficulty. So why they suggest is um, uh, when the patient is having a higher BMI, access to the tooth and access for the procedure will be uh, limited. So uh, considering how much uh, the surgical difficulties and uh, the patient factors would easily make you understand whether this can be done under uh, local anesthesia with sedation or not, or general anesthesia. Um, Nowadays, uh, patients come to us telling us that, you know, I have read about dry socket and will I get a dry socket? So it is a very uh, uh, distressing complication to most patients and it will take up your clinical time as well if a patient comes with dry socket. So it's something that we uh, need to avoid. Um, so simple things like having a good flap closure and protecting the blood clot. Um, uh, avoid uh, habits like uh, smoking. Uh, tell the patient not to smoke during these days. And uh, that will help improving oral hygiene. These are some simple facts uh, that we can do uh, before we uh, are to avoid uh, a dry socket. This interesting study shows that um, the menstrual cycle uh, affects the possibility of a dry socket. So you know that uh, women on contraceptives have a higher incidence of dry socket. So if somebody comes and asks you uh, whether you know you will get a dry socket, <clears throat> in my practice I do this. So then I tell them, so let's do this um, when you have your menstruation. So that has shown to reduce uh, the chance of a dry socket occurring. Uh, some patients come to us and say they're allergic to almost all uh, medications. So then it becomes a real uh, headache how to control pain, post-operative pain. So tramadol with an antiemetic can be given to such patients who are allergic to NSAIDs and paracetamol. But remember, uh, tramadol is very difficult to obtain from pharmacies. So you have to give a prescription and in Osusala, only on certain Osusala pharmacies, you can buy that. So if you're going to um, prescribe a patient tramadol, uh, I would advise you to first ask the patient to buy the tramadol before you start the procedure, because uh, it's going to be a really stressful and a painful journey for the patient going from pharmacy to pharmacy, uh, trying to find this medicine. Um, we can use long acting anesthesia like Marcaine and uh, the, the morphine that I told you at, the, uh, at one of the first slides where we can use morphine to reduce pain as an injection. Uh, and this serapeptidase. Serapeptidase is an enzyme uh, which uh, reduces inflammation as well as post-operative pain. So there are systematic reviews and meta-analysis proving uh, that it has a good role in surgically 
removal of wisdom teeth. So um, a 10 milligrams or 15 milligrams BD or TDS dose uh, can be given to patients and that can uh, relieve post-operative swelling pain as well as trismus. Again, this is not available in most pharmacies, so um, better to know where this is available if you're planning to prescribe. The patient has lingual nerve numbness. What can I do? Um, I, I chose this question because inferior allular nerve uh, injuries are very um, unlikely and uh, we don't encounter them very much because now we take precautions. We don't go in and try to remove the complete root if that is going to cause harm to the patient. We try procedures like uh, coronectomy and we use cone beam CT more frequently to assess the nerve relationship. So inferior allular nerve damage is becoming less and less seen and anyway it has only a one in a thousand or more uh, incidents, uh, less incidents, yeah. So lingual nerve numbness is much more common. It can even be due to your anesthesia and it could be due to just raising a flap on the lingual side to protect the bone. You're not gonna raise a flap, but just putting a periosteal elevator to that side can cause numbness of the lingual nerve. So it's not a big deal. And uh, neuropraxia is the most common. And uh, recently we uh, followed up about 15 to 20 patients who had lingual nerve injuries. And what we found out was that the same in literature, all of these patients recover within two to three months. Um, and um, you would see that the patient would in a visual analog scale uh, start saying that the nerve is getting, you know, functioning. Uh, after a week or two, they would first say that uh, the subject is go of a zero from a zero to 10 visual analog scale, if you ask the patient. And after a week, they might say, now I have three. And after a few weeks, they would say, now it's five. So like that, you would gradually find uh, the, the nerve improving. And this is very important to follow up the patient. And using this uh, modern communication techniques like texting, I find uh, this is a very good way to keep in touch with a patient who has uh, nerve numbness because that keeps a record. Uh, I, I would ask the patient now, uh, what is your score from zero to 10 scale? And the patient would say three. And after one or two weeks, I would say, last week you said three, is it now better? The patient would say, now it's five. So like that, whatever the patient records uh, and will be there for us to see and uh, it's a good way to see and be with the patient. Sometimes it's very distressing. And um, I remember one patient called me um, one time and said, I'm trying to eat ice cream and it tastes like rubber. So um, reassuring at that time is very important. So that day I really realized uh, following up your patients and trying to see uh, their journey in the recovery is very important because that patient was really uh, distressed. And another patient told me that she's a lawyer and when she tries to speak um, in Sinhala, uh, she can't speak properly. Um, and uh, one lady had bilateral numbness of the tongue. So you can understand how distressing that can be. So that's what got me to uh, follow up all these patients and then all of them recovered within two months. So that is uh, a very good indicator and something to be reassured. Patients need reassurance so that they know things will recover with time. They need you to tell that because um, they don't understand. And uh, the most frustrating part to the patient is nobody else sees that. Uh, so when the patient says, my tongue is numb, um, the relatives or um, any, any, any of the family of the patient doesn't feel what the patient feels. So they don't get the empathy part from the family because they don't understand what that person is saying. So I feel that is one reason that you need to be with the patient on uh, such complications. 
So lingual nerve numbness is uh, much more serious. Uh, damage is much more serious than the inferior alveolar nerve because this is more common. And uh, as you see in the nerve bundle, if this cuts and opens in the soft tissue area, uh, there can be fibroblast growth and scarring between the nerve. So unlike in the inferior alveolar canal where the uh, nerve has a guided path to regenerate in the lingual nerve, uh, it doesn't happen. So it turns into a neuroma. So patients will start getting pain uh, after a while. So uh, neuroma, lingual nerve neuroma is uh, a common uh, thing when the nerve gets damaged. So uh, the protocol is if you find a patient having lingual nerve anesthesia, you have to follow up that patient. So have a, a subjective and an objective uh, measurements. You ask the patient how the patient feels and then you ask the patient to come and then you check with pressure, um, uh, pricking, two-point discrimination, heat and cold uh, touches to see how much of uh, sensation the patient has lost. And then you can record it to see whether it's improving. Uh, a short course of uh, prednisolone starting from a dose of 30 to gradually going down, um, anti-inflammatory uh, NSAIDs and uh, things like neurobion, which uh, helps to regenerate nerves can help in this recovery time. So remember, follow-up is very important. And if the recovery is not seen, if there is no significant part to recovery within six to eight weeks, then we need to do an MRI and decide on nerve repair. So remember, nerve injury can happen as a result of surgery. That is not purely negligence. It can happen. But the negligence will be if you don't follow up the patient and uh, you know, uh, guide the patient to proper investigations and management. But uh, to reassure you, uh, the lingual nerve damage is very less because uh, we don't raise lingual flaps and don't try to cut into the lingual side bone uh, when you're trying to take wisdom tooth uh, you know, out. And uh, because I have seen one or two cases uh, of lingual nerve damage. And when you open the lingual side flap, you see the whole side of the bone has been trimmed and removed. So, uh, don't go into such uh, aggressive approaches to take out a road. If you think you can't take it out, just leave it. Don't do much harm than uh, already there is. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, I, I managed to stick to time. Uh, thank you, Nadina, for an excellent presentation. And uh, yeah. what what uh, uh, what is more uh, you know um, important as well as uh, attractive about your presentation is what I guess is uh, that uh, you have I think answered all the questions that the participants are having, so they have run out of questions at the moment. <laughs> so because the thing is, I am looking at the chat and I can't see a single question coming up at the moment. So maybe all the questions that they have been, asking have been answered, so they don't have any more questions. So what I'll do is, if you don't mind, um, uh, yeah. shall I give them at least about uh, two minutes to come up with any other okay. questions and, you know, just to sink in what you have said and if they have any issues, uh, and then I'll forward it to you. Please do, yeah. Mm -hmm. not, a, not an issue. Right. Uh, Nadina, uh, I have one question. Okay. Uh, uh, the so question is, uh, can, we, uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, can we use a high-speed handpiece like air rotor with a diamond no, particle for bone removal? Definitely not. Uh, I have had uh, actually uh, that, that uh, if I remembered that I would have entered that. Uh, one dental surgeon once called me and said uh, he used one and uh, patients suddenly got uh, surgical emphysema. They are going into the tissues, so not at all. And uh, especially in an environment like this where it generates a lot of aerosols and um, definitely uh, I, it's contraindicated. Okay. And thank you. And uh, there's another question. Now the questions are rolling in. Uh, yes. Uh, 
does neurobin uh, neurobion has proven results in nerve regeneration yes it has uh, proven results in uh, neural generation but not specific to uh, uh, wisdom tooth nerve injuries so uh, uh, i don't know how to answer your question with regard to uh, uh, lingual nerve or the id uh, inferior allular nerve but uh, it has proven effects in uh, neural regeneration so it's a common medicine used in uh, uh, neurology so there's no harm in trying to give that uh, because whatever the benefits we can get from it so um, Uh, another question is: uh, Could you please explain the importance of dexamethasone after surgical removal? Dexamethasone uh, before surgery is a proven, uh, you know, maximum benefit. Uh, if you give uh, IV immediately or uh, orally one hour before, then you would get the uh, best uh, uh, results of it. Um, but uh, you know, post-operative would also give some effects as well as. uh dexamethasone is proven to uh, reduce things like uh, nausea and it uh, complements analgesia as well so there's no harm but uh, in a practical setup the tablet comes in a 0.5 mg dosage so when you say about 4 mg um the pharmacist is going to get scared and they are going to scare the patient so uh, better you inform the patient that uh, this is uh, the dosage and why it will be a lot of tiny tablets okay now in the case if you don't have uh, dexamethasone uh, would betamethasone would be a substitute no 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 i i have no uh, idea with uh, betamethasone sorry okay and uh, there's another question is uh, we were taught i nb technique that is the indirect technique Where the needle was inserted via the retromolar triangle, avoiding the muscles, is this still relevant today or practiced today? I don't know why, but we uh, go by the direct technique. Um, so uh, the indirect technique is uh, not very much used. Um, here, I think uh, 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 the thing is that the thinner the needle you uh, use, uh, there is a risk of uh, maybe uh, I, i don't know uh, this is not used here uh, and we practice the direct yes i have also thought about this because anterior technique uh, that i showed is uh, trying to avoid the muscle mm -hmm. uh, and i was thinking yes this is the same reason why we uh, go through first uh, in a parallel way and then move uh, to the opposite side uh, in a indirect technique where we release anesthesia so Uh, i think prof uh, uh, is very correct to mention this i think uh, indirect technique would uh, cause less damage than the direct technique so so it's a good eye opener should we change to uh, indirect technique so what are the advantages and disadvantages so you mean to say it's not practice uh, uh, it's uh, not practice in sri lanka or Uh, not no, no. Most of the foreign graduates, especially uh, Indians and even British, uh, I have uh, uh, seen that they still practice uh, the uh, the indirect technique. But because okay. the faculty we use the direct technique, um, oh, so right. the foreign graduates uh, have it uh, find it a bit difficult uh, because they are used to the indirect technique. So definitely, um, it has uh, its advantages. and another question uh, professor forwarded is we were taught a split bone technique where burrs were not used only a chisel and a mallet to split the lingual bone and move it away from the impacted tooth with the flap to gain access to the tooth is this practice today uh, no sir no it's not practice because uh, it uh, becomes a bit more traumatic to the patient where you um, use a hammer and a uh, you know uh, knocking into the bone uh, and um, there are more reports of lingual nerve injury when you attend this and uh, in unskilled hands uh, this is a very dangerous area to um, handle such an instrument so uh, i think uh, uh, using the burr and going through the buccal area is uh, developed mainly to avoid such complications okay and uh, there's another question dear sir can you please explain 
how the local acidic environment around third molar due to abscess prevent the nerve from getting anesthetized when the local anesthetic agent is used most centrally as block injection uh, yes so uh, when uh, there is an inflammatory situation uh, now in this situation you are not talking about the intrapulpal okay now when the in, inside the pulp uh, the nerves are inflamed uh, the anesthesia doesn't infiltrate into the pulp because uh, the apical areas are uh, swelled up so that's why we need to give intrapulpal whatever you do uh, when you need to cut into the tooth you can't cut it you might be able to extract the tooth but when you need to split it the patient will get pain this is the same reason uh, I'm, i'm sure dr siri mevan knows uh, when you uh, when you give anesthesia you can it's difficult to get anesthesia to do root canal treatment mm -hmm. i find it easier to extract teeth but doing root canal treatment is difficult when this uh, pulp is inflamed that is uh, anesthesia doesn't infiltrate into the pulp so that's one thing um, what you are talking about is with infection there is an inflammation so the uh, the nerves have become into a hyper uh, sensitive state so if you go back to my slide uh, i'm sure that uh, i think dr sirima will share these slides uh, uh, and uh, in that paper they really talk about how marcaine Uh, has a better effect on these uh, inflamed uh, nerves uh, rather than lignocaine. So just um, that uh, explains how that works. Uh, just one question now uh, regarding articaine and uh, marcaine, are they available? Articaine uh, is not available in Sri Lanka. Uh, marcaine, uh, which is B, is available. Right. Artekin is a very good anesthesia which infiltrates, but it is not given as a block injection because yeah. it can have long-term um, anesthesia. So, uh, marcaine is available in Sri Lanka, but artekin is not. Marcaine, artekin is not. Um, another question: uh, Shall we leave the root which slip through the lingual plate into the soft tissue, or should we explode? Uh, this has happened to me once, and then I thought, if I go to explore this, uh, I will not be able to get it. So, if this root part is still uh, enveloped inside the periosteum, there's nothing to worry at all. The bone will form, and then it will uh, it will become like another foreign object, or it might uh, get uh, fixed to the bone. Uh, even if it goes to the lingual area. Uh, trying to remove it immediately will just push it away uh, deep and deep so if it is going to give problems later uh, then there will be fibros around the tooth and sometimes there can be uh, a fistula formation where we can track it later so i would advise you if you think such a thing happens uh, don't try to attempt to get it uh, because you might push it deeper into it into the tissues just explain to the patient and refer to a specialist where we will monitor the patient and uh, handle if there are complications okay and the last question is uh, is there uh, i'm sorry there are two questions now coming in uh, the, the one before the last is, is there any contraangle slow speed hand piece like what is shown in some videos yeah <laughs> that's my dream as well still it's not there <laughs> <laughs> If you get it, please let me know. <laughs> Now, uh, another question regarding marking: Is there heavy marking and plain marking? What can we use in this setting, or rather, general dental setting? I think that's what she meant. Uh, honestly, heavy marking and uh, uh, maybe you're referring to the dosage. Yeah, um, I, I have only. Yeah, so I think it's about. Uh, Five percent marking that comes. I don't know what you mean by heavy marking. So if there's a higher dose, you can dilute it. But uh, remember, when you are using marking, it's not the. I can't teach you everything about marking here. You have to titrate like uh, lignocaine. Uh, you have to know that the patient doesn't have, uh, you know, heart conditions, and you have to be careful. So marking cannot be given excessive like lignocaine. It has a uh, lethal dose. Now, uh, actually, now she has said about the molecular weight. That's what she was talking about. No, I, I'm not aware of it. Sorry. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Now I think that's wrap. I've been just never used to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I think that wraps up the the question time. I'm sure you are now really uh, getting <laughs> exhausted by the questions as well. I'm sorry about it, but thing is, no, uh, it shows the 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 interest that uh, you have generated by your by your webinar. So, okay. uh, on behalf of the Sri Lanka Dental Association as well as the Common Dent uh, Commonwealth Dental Association, I would like to thank you uh, for a very, uh, you can call it an enlightening uh, presentation and Professor uh, D.Y.D. Samarnak uh, has also mentioned or rather has thanked you through thank the chat you. as well. Mm -hmm. So it's very informative and uh, uh, your, your e-certificate will be uh, uh, posted to you in due course. Uh, thank, you. thank you so much for um, spending time with us and uh, making an effort to give us an excellent webinar and excellent insight as well. So on behalf of the Sri Lanka Dental Association and Commonwealth Dental Association, I would like to thank again. And uh, I would like to um, uh, mention the fact that we are having another webinar on the third week of uh, this month, uh, Sunday. The speaker is yet to be finalized. And we have another webinar the fourth week of uh, this month as well, or on this Sunday at 8. So uh, I would like to wish everybody uh, Good night or rest of the uh, day, whatever the uh, amount of time that you are having. Yeah, and somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'll see you at the next webinar. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Much. Thank you both. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye.